In the middle of the 20th century, arguably the two most dominant ways of thinking about human nature and psychology was behaviorism, uh, Skinnerian operant conditioning being the preeminent part of that, and psychoanalysis, dominated by Freudian perspectives on personality. Now, if you think about it, these two positions are very, very different from each other, but they share the common feature of being highly deterministic. For behaviorists, we're completely shaped by rewards and punishments uh, by our environment. And for Freud, our behavior is completely determined by unconscious processes that we are unaware of and have no control over. In the 1950s and 1960s, there were a group of psychologists who started to push back against this. They felt confined by this way of thinking, and they did not think that these highly deterministic theories accurately captured what human beings were all about. And they began to uh, start their own school of thought. Now, there were two different camps, humanistic psychologists and existential psychologists. Your textbook talks just about humanistic psychology, which I will do as well, but I'm also going to talk about existential psychology. There are some subtle differences between them, but they share a lot in common as well, and together they have come to be known as third force psychology. Third force meaning they're the third force after psychoanalysis and behaviorism, a different way of thinking about human beings. Their basic principles were simple. They did not believe that human behavior is determined. They believed that humans have free will and that they are free to choose their own existence and their own way of being. And they also thought the, con uh, the focus of psychoanalysis was too strongly placed on mental disorders and unhappy people. Third force psychology was focused on helping healthy individuals achieve their full potential. Now, the subtle differences between them are slight. Humanistic psychologists believe that people are innately good. Everybody is born with a good potential, and we strive to actualize that inner potential. A happy, fulfilled life is one where the person um, gets to be all that they were meant to be. Existential psychologists didn't necessarily believe that people were born good, but they didn't think they were born bad either. And for existential psychologists, it's all about taking control and creating meaning in your life. We have to overcome our basic passivity and create meaning. And so if you are unhappy or anxious for an existential psychologist, the reason for that is you have refused to step up and take charge of your life the way you should. Here is a list of some of the most famous third force psychologists. Martin Heidegger is sort of the founder of existential psychology. He's the one that created the bridge between existential philosophy and existential psychology. And almost all existential psychologists can trace their roots back to him in one way or another. Rollo May was a famous humanistic psychologist who was tremendously popular with the public. He wrote a lot of best-selling books and was very in, uh, influential in shaping the way people thought about humanistic psychology. Eric Fromm eventually became the most eminent existential psychotherapist, and he believed that psychopathology resulted from uh, our kind of caving in to cultural forces and not creating meaning in our life. We just sort of float along passively, and we need to overcome that. Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers are two very influential humanistic psychologists. I'll talk about Rogers first. I'll talk about Rogers much more in a later module when we talk about therapy and psychological disorders. Carl Rogers uh, grew up in Oak Park, Illinois, and developed a theory that's designed primarily for psychotherapy that's come to be known as person-centered therapy. According to Rogers, human beings are motivated by a single positive force to actualize our own benign inner potential. He believed that all humans have a pervasive and persistent need for warmth. We need to be liked, we need to re be respected, we need to be accepted. In other words, we need positive regard. And if we don't have positive regard, we're not gonna be able to feel good about ourselves and we are not going to be able to actualize our potentials. 
And so what happens to people, according to Rogers, is we grow up um, with this ideal version of ourself, what we ought to be, this notion of the person that we should be. But then we also see our real self. And this creates usually a big incongruence. You hardly ever live up to your ideal self. And so the problem for Rogers when people are unhappy is they allow themselves to be obsessed with the conditions of worth that have been placed on us by other people or that you think have been placed on us by other, other people. So you may feel like your parents won't like you if you don't get straight A's. Your friends won't like you if you're not thin. Uh, you've got something that you think other people value, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be a worthwhile person. And the fully functioning person, according to Rogers, is the one who overcomes this and is able to um, self-actualize. If you go to a Rogerian therapist, which is what they're called, that person is going to treat you with unconditional positive regard. The therapist is going to accept you and uh, help you overcome these conditions of worth that have been placed on you by others. We'll talk much more about Rogers in the next module. Abraham Maslow is another influential uh, humanistic psychologist, and he is uh, believed that people will only be happy when their basic needs are met. This pyramid represents Maslow's famous hierarchy of needs. And if you take any other psychology courses, you're almost certainly gonna see this same pyramid in many different contexts in other courses. But according to Maslow, the goal is self-actualization. You want to achieve that potential that you have uh, and to self-actualize and become the kind of person you were meant to be. A self-actualized person accurately perceives reality, is spontaneous, they accept themselves and others as they are, they're autonomous and creative, they have deep, meaningful relationships, and they're, they frequently have what are called peak experiences, where you just are in the zone and feeling completely satisfied with life. But we can't get to the top of the pyramid until your basic needs are satisfied. So at the very bottom of the scale, you have your basic physiological needs. You need air, you need water, you need food. And if you don't have those things, none of the other needs really matter. You're obsessed with just staying alive. Assuming that those are met, you move up to the next level, which are your safety needs. So maybe you have enough food, water, and air, but you feel like your existence is precarious. At any moment, you may lose your job and be financially ruined, not be able to support your family. And so now you're obsessed with those needs to feel safe and secure. If you get past that level, we move into the area of feeling the need to be, to belong, to be part of a group, to be accepted and loved by other people, to have friends, to have a romantic partner. And a lot of people spend much of their life at this level searching for that feeling of belonging. Once you have that, you then move on to the area of esteem needs. So not only do you need to belong somewhere, you have the need to have other people think well of you, to feel like you're a competent, worthwhile person. And once all of those needs have been satisfied, you can then move to the top of the pyramid and worry about self-actualization. Now, this is not a permanent thing. When you get to the top, things in life can change and you can tumble back down and have to start all over again. But for Maslow, the achieving of your inner potential depends very much on the satisfaction of needs.